I'm delighted to be here and uh, to be invited to uh, speak in this conference on this uh, session. Uh, I agree in uh, what was just said about the actual importance of the topic for the, the health uh, care industry and for the whole area and also for the populations. And um, I was uh, asked to talk about HTA and I was specifically also asked to address uh, targeted therapies and immunotherapies and oncology. And I will indeed do that, but I will also be uh, addressing a number of more general issues. I, um, I'm a professor in Denmark and I'm now working as an independent consultant after I worked for many years in the state agency, the uh, National Authority of Health in, in Denmark, where I led the build-up of HTA uh, and um, I was also a lot involved in, Euro in uh, international collaboration, um, including uh, leading the establishment of uh, UNETA, the European Network for HTA. So I do speak out of uh, a broad background. I'm sort of a kind of generalist rather than a very, very specialized individual, but I am used to communicate with many different kinds of contributing sciences. So let's go into this. Um, so there's a lot uh, of focus on the prices of pharmaceuticals in uh, in oncology, uh, and maybe well, it's a, it's appropriate because that is really the painful part of decision making. But perhaps it's too narrow focus. Perhaps there should be a broader focus on uh, care as such and the role of pharmaceuticals and other interventions in care, including also, of course, looking at the prices of uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'll address uh, one example in the area of melanoma. Mm -hmm. And I chose that because uh, the Danish Medicines Council, which is a body, a, a national body that informs the five regions in my country, on uh, the use of uh, hospital drugs, expensive hospital drugs. They look at single uh, drugs, they look at groups of drugs, and they also develop guidelines for the use of these drugs. And interestingly, several other uh, uh, agencies within the last, say, nine months, uh, said in different ways yes to this intervention. Then I'll talk about the HTA process and how it links up to decision-making processes and uh, what are the good research practices in HTA. Um, how similar are the research methodologies across the institutions? Uh, is there more or less a shared uh, approach? I'll address that. And then I'll go into work to try to get a more formalized work across borders between agencies in different countries to reduce duplication and increase the quality. And then I'll come up with a number of solutions, including hospital-based HTA. So let's go into it. First of all, this is sort of a, a more or less agreed definition of HTA. Interestingly, we see a lot that um, uh, health economists over the last 10 years increasingly have turned to say that they are doing HTA, which, as, well, which I, as a person who worked in HTA for a long time, actually uh, invites very much. I think it's great. I think that HTA is broader than health economics, but it does indeed include health economics as a very important part, just like the uh, systematic uh, review of evidence. So it's multidisciplinary, it's based on evidence, and it supports decision making. So it's not an academic exercise for its own purposes of developing. Um, it looks at properties and effects of, uh, of technologies. These can be a number of different technologies. It can be interventions like drugs, but also, say, radiotherapy. It can be diagnostics, and it can be cares of different kind. And it has a comparative approach, uh, trying to uh, identify a current standard and then comparing any new technologies with that. <clears throat> 
The aim is to determine added value. And, um, and the last part is just basically saying that it's, uh, it uh, is supposed to following the, the normal broad expectations of research, that it works in an analytic framework, that it's systematic, transparent, and unbiased. And these things uh, are uh, what is aimed at. It's not always uh, met. So I'd look at the, this Danish Medicines Council. So no to uh, uh, Tafinlar and Mechanist, and other bodies actually said yes. So let's see how they arrived to, to these uh, conclusions. So in December, about six months ago, <clears throat> the overall assessment of this um, issue, what is the clinical added value of uh, adjuvant treatment uh, in resected patients with stage three melanoma, it said that it, it's not recommended. It was based on the interim uh, reporting of a study that started, uh, stopped including patient in 2017. It's a multi uh, center, multinational uh, study. And um, it had probably planned interim analysis. And uh, after the first and the second interim analysis, uh, an application was sent to FDA in USA and to EMA in Europe for marketing approval of this combination. So the study had planned to be at least five years, but uh, it was uh, sent for approval before that because of the results of the interim report. And uh, so the council said that it could not recommend, um, but if patients would have contraindication to immune therapy, it might on an individual basis be uh, prescribed for that particular patient. And then the council said that there's actually a planned five year survival data to be available in 2022, and we will come back to the issue at that time. So some emphasis on uh, the quality of the, uh, of the, uh, of the data, um, they say in principle that it provides an important clinical added value, but it's not substantiated through the uh, uh, data in, insufficient. The quality of the evidence is deemed very low. Then they are concerned about adverse effects that can be rather severe in these kinds of uh, targeted uh, therapies. And um, they underline this interim analysis that is uh, very much associated with uncertainty. The, the way that it's done in Denmark is that there is this clinical assessment, but then there is a, a parallel economic assessment. Uh, and that assessment is based on budget impact. So the company is asked to submit uh, information of expected budget impact for the healthcare system and for the patient. So it's not cost effectiveness, it's not societal, it doesn't include loss of pro pro productivity, etc. But it does expect, according to very strict guidelines, that a budget impact uh, is made so that the uh, effects can be combined between the clinical effects and the economic effects. Um, so, um, Looking over to England and Wales, they were a little earlier and they did recommend this. They said it's an option for adjuvant therapy, but it can only be recommended uh, if uh, it, uh, the company is providing this uh, drug with a discount that is agreed uh, in a commercial uh, arrangements. So the mechanism that we've seen develop uh, in uh, NICE in UK and, and Wales is that in parallel with the uh, health economics, which is the output that is really counting because they use uh, cost effectiveness, they use the ICER and the thresholds of the ICER, the price of the drug is actually quite influential on um, the uh, where uh, in relation to the threshold the ICER uh, hits. And so sometimes you would say that 
in December they say no, and then you will see a news after three, four months that they say yes, and that is because there have been some um, negotiations that are not disclosed, so undisclosed uh, information about the price. Uh, so only when this price is in place can the drug be recommended in UK. Then there are other aspects that they underline. Currently there are no adjuvant treatments available. So that's actually an important one. For this particular one with this uh, mutation, um, there is no specific intervention. There are more uh, broader interventions, but identifying this group, this one is the first one that is actually proving or showing some effect. And there is indeed substantial risk of the cancer returning, although resection has been made fully. So therefore, this is a new intervention, and um, it's important. Uh, so it's underlining that there is an unmet need, and there's, it's also underlining that this is a new therapy. Things that may actually be sort of rewarded in the process of reaching uh, the final recommendation. Um, So they say that it does extend the length of time people have before uh, recurrence. Um, and they, based on these uh, data and expert uh, opinion, uh, underline that the, there is an increase in the overall length of time that people live. Then they look at cost effectiveness and they say that, yes, these models show us that it is within the range that the NHS is willing to pay for the drug. Therefore, it can be recommended. So clinical effect is deemed on the basis of the interim, which is impressive when you look at the survival information, uh, combined with the economic uh, result of the negotiations lead to their uh, positive recommendation. Let's go to uh, Germany. Uh, Germany has a system where the National Institute ICWIC is requested by something called GBA uh, to do assessments. <clears throat> the GBA is, is a joint uh, commission uh, that uh, eventually makes the recommendations. So the role of the ICWIC is to do assessment. Now international equal, ICWIC is seen as a very strict and very methodology-focused uh, uh, institution. Uh, but they actually, in the beginning of this year, said that there is indication of considerable, considerable ad added value. When they say considerable added value, it's a kind of ranking that is uh, substantial. So positive effects on survival and also on uh, the uh, relapse uh, frequency is shown. They underline also the importance of these uh, negative effects um, and that it is uh, considerable. There are no data about health-related quality of life. Uh, and this is actually uh, very explicitly asked for by EQUIC. They are very interested in getting patient-reported outcomes and uh, health-related quality of life data. And in this case, there was nothing presented. So that's why they also somewhat downgraded the extent of the added value. Then um, in March, there was uh, the conclusion by the by the payer, you could say, the body of the, the committee of the payer. They say that it's indicated as a treatment uh, on this indication, and they say that there is indication of considerable added value. So we see that basically the same data are leading to somewhat different conclusions when they go through these assessments and appraisals. So Sweden in March this year, TLV, which is again a body that uh, is national and it uh, is a state body, but it is uh, working with the regions of Sweden that are holders of the, uh, of the purse and running of the healthcare system in Sweden. They underline that there are only data for a limited period and um, it makes it difficult to estimate. 
And so they um, can only uh, do estimations, obviously, beyond the, 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 the time of follow-up until cutoff. But they are able to, um, uh, to model a quality gain of 1.28 which is a quality adjusted life year gained of 1.2, 1.3, that's uh, substantial in this area. Um, and they, they do the normal uh, motions of sensitivity analysis and find that the, this uh, result is uh, rather robust. The report doesn't give the actual price for a quality, uh, uh, but that, that's not so important here. So let me say that <clears throat> The Swedish, they are looking, of course, at the clinical effect, and then they are doing cost effectiveness and some budget impact analysis. In Germany, they are uh, uh, requested to do uh, early assessments, and these assessments are only superficially actually addressing economics, mainly looking at clinical effects. In UK, the the, re the things are revolving around the uh, economic modeling. In Denmark, the uh, emphasis is on the uh, effect, on the quality of the studies, and budget impact, not cost effectiveness. So different kinds of sending feedback to the decision makers. And let's then look at this one briefly. This is actually uh, from a conference in, in two, two and a half year ago. So what is observed is that regulatory authorities are approving these new drugs uh, much earlier and with less mature evidence. There's a pressure for that. Uh, because if there is an unmet need, there is this argument that this drug should, of course, be brought to a market as soon as we have sufficient evidence that there is efficacy and reasonable safety. So they are looking at efficacy, and that is coming directly out of the, uh, of the trials. What the HTAs are more looking at is the same, but they're looking at the real-world application the uh, effectiveness in, in, in real life. And here the problems start to be because it's difficult to estimate so early. And uh, that is an, an increasing problem that because of the approval for marketing by the regulators, the HTA bodies in several countries do have to make within a reasonable time, say half a year, assessments. And these assessments are then put on the table of the decision makers and the pressures are, um, are increasing. So there are also a number of methodological challenges in this area because these are really new mechanisms of, uh, of intervention, uh, targeted therapies and immunotherapies. And I already alluded to the pressures uh, from the public uh, and the payers and professionals are under pr uh, pr pressure to contain costs. So what we can see is that uncertainty is increasing and uncertainty is something that payers really don't like. So they are not happy with doing uh, major decisions on procurement, expenditure, uh, with uh, um, uh, um, uh, substantial uncertainty. Um, is there a solution to this? Well, several solutions are being developed. For example, these um, introduction negotiations of the price, different kinds of schemes uh, 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 that are negotiated and agreed between the payers and the, the manufacturers that will help the introduction. Uh, often uh, these are linked up to uh, real-world evidence collection to follow up to see if real-world results are actually uh, as good uh, as expected from the efficacy studies. These are demanding uh, kinds of studies. They, they take resources also from the clinicians to this, do this kind of uh, data collection, but no doubt this is the way that things are moving, that there need to be a much more uh, prospective data collection uh, uh, along the introduction of new interventions in the current pathways of treatment. <clears throat> 
Um, so I'll turn to good practices in HTA uh, because of, uh, recently we published uh, in Value in Health uh, a ISPOR report from uh, uh, a working group that have made a white paper with trying to get an overview of uh, where are there good uh, practices in doing HTA internationally and where are there uh, spots where we need to do something. And this was with the involvement of of, uh, of uh, uh, people with different uh, scientific backgrounds from different countries, in, including health economists, uh, uh, Michael Drummond, I think he spoke here last year, and several other key people in, the, in their different areas. <clears throat> and uh, the first thing that we uh, clarified, or we clarified as we went along, is the, the relations between what we call the HTA process and the uh, decision-making process. So the decision-makers, obviously from what we just heard with this example, they have this pressure to make a decision. They need to have some kind of analysis before they make uh, the decision. Although I have been in countries where people are saying, here the minister says it's no problem, I can always make the decision. And so there's no need to have any kind of policy background for the decision. However, this is an extreme case. In most cases, there is really a need to have defined ways of, uh, of uh, considering options. That is called po policy analysis then uh, a step of recommendation and decision. And over looking at the, at this side, the process, uh, I'll go into a few uh, parts of it, but it's defining the HTA process in general, then assessment, what we call contextualization, that's what is called appraisal in UK, but appraisal in UK and assessment uh, has the same uh, interpretation into uh, many languages, including Danish, maybe Russian as well. That's why we actually use the more uh, original uh, word for that, bringing into context or contextualization, and then implementation. So the first one is very much a general thing that for the HTA to be really useful, it needs to be uh, agreed how it should work uh, with those who are requesting reports. So what is the stru structure and governance and the organizational aspects of doing this HTA? This is very, very clear because of the maturity of say UK. Uh, it's very clear in Germany, both because of uh, of, uh, of experience several years, but also because the Germans really like to have all these things very clear described. Uh, but also say in Sweden and Denmark, it's quite clear which role, what is expected, what is not expected. Actually you see, and this is an example I will not go into because of time, that in Germany we saw that eQuick made their first assessment on the request of GBA of uh, Optivo and then uh, they were actually asked to reassess, and the first one they said um, uh, there's no evidence of effect, and the second one they said there's an uh, unquantifiable effect of of, of Divo. So in, in this case, the requester actually asked them to reconsider, and they found something that led to this shift. So this. Uh, is reflecting that there are certain expectations of division of work, for example. Um, then um, uh, there's something called framing and scoping, where it's actually uh, clarified what are the key questions that should be answered, um, what output is uh, expected, uh, required. Um, this is an important step that uh, uh, is uh, sometimes uh, by some people seen as uh, breaking the arm's length between the requester and the doer, but actually you need to have this clarified to actually uh, do the work that they're re requesting. So in the case from Germany, it's not necessarily because GBA was discontent with the output of the first one done by eQuick, but maybe there were unclarities about what, for example, would be the comparator to use in the assessment. So that's why it's also sometimes seen as iterative. In this case, probably that should have been done before they sent their first assessment and then were asked to redo it. 
the assessment phase is the phase of looking at the evidence, uh, and this is uh, clinical assessment, it's cost effectiveness analysis, it's uh, budget impact analysis. Uh, but it's also impact on health system. Uh, so the uh, consequences for health system when looking at more complex interventions, like the ones we're talking about here, are beyond only looking at the clinical effect and uh, any health economic uh, budget impact. It is also about how can we actually incorporate this new technology in our hospitals. What kind of requirements will be in terms of expertise, of diagnostics, in vitro imaging, etc.? What is the load of extra diagnostics that are needed uh, in the provision of the care? Of course, that can also come out as uh, data into the economic modeling, but it has indeed a very important uh, value in itself, namely for the management, the clinical management of care. This is a overly uh, ignored in most uh, reports at this time. They are focusing on the clinical assessment and economic assessment and forgetting about these things that are actually so important when you move to implementation. I can see that I will have difficulties with, with uh, being within the time allotted, but no, no problem with that. Um, the context contextualization is the committee work. This is where you take the assessment work based on evidence, the structured research-based inf information, and put it into a deliberation where you discuss the different options and discuss the results of the assessment. How are they going to be applicable? How are we going to turn them into a, re a, a, a recommendation? Um, and um, often, as I mentioned, this is... Uh, uh, committee work with different methods are being uh, uh, developed to try to uh, to manage this process to make it more transparent and clear what actually goes on in committees. Uh, I'm trying to uh, stop my uh, timer here. <laughs> um, so uh, we we could conclude that. Uh, there are some good practices re related to defining HTA processes, uh, but uh, they're, they're not very uh, evolved. Uh, there's a lot of work to do on international standards for defining processes. Assessment, that is an area where there's really a lot of internationally agreed good standards. That's all the things about uh, handling the evidence, it's about uh, looking at epidemiological data, it's about health economics, etc. So this is where we can actually say that there's no need to start from scratch developing guidelines. There are a lot of good things around and we actually see uh, a lot of overlap in the use of uh, these good practices. In terms of contextualization, there is not a lot of uh, international consensus about how this uh, should be done, but there are a lot of on, uh, underlinings of transparency, uh, considering uh, uh, appropriateness, uh, transparency, independence, etc. So uh, there are many good practices in the uh, area of assessment uh, and in the defining. Uh, but when it comes to structure, governance, organizational aspects and monitoring of HTA, there is not a lot. This is an area where international organizations such as WHO and INATA could actually do an important work. Uh, so I'll go very, very briefly to uh, a study that I made for the European Commission looking at uh, the methodologies in the EU and Norway. And um, um, the, the general impression is that uh, the institutions that are looking at drugs, and these uh, were at that time uh, 38 in these countries, that they are uh, mostly overlapping, or so much overlapping with the methodologies that are described in the HTA core model for relative effectiveness assessment developed by UNETA. So that is their view on overlap. Um, choice of comparator, there's this discussion whether you should uh, or, uh, try to choose the, 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 the comparator that is the current applied 
uh, technology to compare with or a com uh, compare with an existing uh, well-documented uh, uh, comparator. And as you see, uh, there are uh, relatively few that mainly will underline that there is good data. Uh, most will uh, actually be happy to see that uh, both requirements could be met. So um, there are problems currently also in this area that we are focusing on that sometimes it's actually difficult to find sufficient documentation for the current comparator. Um, that can also be in treatment areas where the current treatments have been there for a long time and were not very well substantiated when they were introduced because requirements at that time were much lower. Um, in terms of what kind of design they would build on, um, they, everybody will, would uh, happily use uh, uh, randomized controlled trials but uh, non-randomized prospective studies, nearly uh, all of them, 32 out of the uh, 38, other kinds of observational studies like case control studies even, are so still substantial, would take it in, but their main request would be the RCTs. The use of expert opinion is also mentioned, but it's interesting to see that and uh, no uh, institution is building on expert opinion without having it being combined with other kinds of evidence, which makes sense because very often you will need the content expertise to interpret the, the uh, evidence. Surrogate endpoints. A large majority of institutions, now we're talking about 48, so it's also institutions that are not looking at drugs, but are looking at, at medical devices, so the number is higher. But surrogate endpoints are generally accepted. This is, of course, in oncology very, very used, uh, very much used. Composite endpoints, you know them from cardiology, uh, cardiac uh, vascular events, etc., are also uh, generally uh, accepted. Um, patient reported endpoints are invited or looked upon by three fourths. And um, indirect comparisons, again, uh, 40 out of the 48 are uh, willing to do in, in, indirect comparisons. This is the case when you, you have no head to head studies, but you have studies that you can look at and put into a, a modeling uh, of looking at the indirect uh, comparison. Very much applied. I'll uh, not spend a lot on the HTA core model that UNETA developed. I will just uh, show you here that there are important aspects beyond the clinical, like cost, organizational aspect, and patient and social aspect. So the full model of HTA uh, is uh, encompassing these more broad uh, aspects um, and uh, but most of the work is uh, done in what is called relative effectiveness assessment, which is looking at the first four, the problem and the use of technology, description of, and technical characteristics of the, uh, of the technology, safety and clinical effectiveness. Um, then number next, that is explicitly used in many countries, more or less systematically, uh, and not necessarily through cost effectiveness uh, analysis and ISERs is uh, cost and economic evaluation. Uh, organization and, and social aspects are more uh, taken in in the uh, committee work in the appraisal phase rather than based on uh, systematic approaching of actual accessible uh, evidence. Um, Unfortunately, UNETA has not uh, been successful in the last years to have a lot of submissions from companies to do joint assessments using this model. But there are some uh, cancer drugs uh, among those that are either starting or have been done. Um, you see here in, uh, in uh, AML, for example, Um, then, uh, just as a prompt, uh, 
when moving into this area, we're talking about, there's a lot about uh, the uh, in vitro diagnostics, the prognosis, uh, the so-called omics, and this is an impre increasingly important area. Actually, I realize I have much more material to share than, than time allows, but, but what we're seeing is that, for example, uh, for the approval of a drug in uh, FDA, the approval is often linking the drug with a specific companion uh, diagnostic, an application. While in, the, uh, in Europe, uh, it is linked to an assay that needs to meet certain criteria. That means actually that the hospital, the country can choose itself the assay that it wants to use. And that means that with all these assays coming in, there is also a need for much more power to assess their quality. And this is what is addressed in this article. So the diagnostics are important. In terms of solutions, um, one thing that uh, is developed very much uh, by the, the, the individual institutions is scientific advice giving advice to the companies as they move typically from phase two to phase three, advising them on uh, what kind of outcomes, what kind of designs would they uh, prefer uh, that the company considered. It's advice, it's the company that has the risk that makes the decision. Over the last five years, this has been developed to also be joint advice given by the EMA and uh, UNETA uh, partners. So this is a mechanism that I think carries a lot of uh, future because it can help the HTAs influence the companies to actually collect the data that will be useful for doing the assessments. While until five years ago, so much focus was on only getting the marketing approval, that is showing the efficacy and safety. And now, well, that's a barrier still, but a key barrier today is actually to get into the decision to actually procure and pay. So uh, evidence generation is going to be very important. Uh, stakeholder cooperation is important. And um, at least have focus on hospital-based HTA. In countries where there is not a very a well established national HTA process, I think the way to move forward is to use uh, HTA at hospital level, bringing the right expertise together uh, to do uh, the information that can be used by hospital management. And this is something that was introduced also in Denmark far, uh, far away uh, earlier, uh, and it was very well received to have a structured way to work in the hospital on procurement, particularly of devices, but also in drug committees. And then international collaboration is definitely also something that needs to go on and we need to reduce duplication of the assessment work where this can be done. But obviously from the example we can see that there is a core that may be done together but when you try to, when you move into uh, interpreting, transmitting it into the national context the requirements currently in the countries that we had it as exam are very difficult, different. So the national still need to do the full HTA process, but certain parts of it, like the clinical assessment of evidence, etc., probably could be done together. And thank you very much.